Hello, I'm Deflating Atheism, and I'm here uh, uh, at long last with with the uh, uh, proprietor of the excellent YouTube channel, uh, Quillen Inc. History. So, uh, well, thank you. Uh, care to introduce yourself and tell us what you're about? Uh, yeah, uh, I run the Quillen Inc. History channel, which is a um, YouTube history channel that mainly focuses on the historical topic of the relationship between science and religion with a main focus on science and Christianity. And I'm currently mainly focusing on uh, science and Christianity during the ancient time, uh, during the ancient time like uh, Greece and Rome and also during the Middle Ages. But I'm also planning to do branch out somewhere in the maybe in a few uh, months or a few years to like start going into like newly uh, Science and religion during the new, uh, newly modern era and uh, during like the 1800s and 1900s and stuff. Okay. It's mainly a YouTube history channel, but with the main focus on science and religion. But I also do other subjects like a bit of military history and the cultural history and maybe sometimes a biography on a person. Okay. So uh, uh, you are a student of history? Uh, not currently. I'm uh, currently studying what's it called political science political science, but uh, I'm in my last semester, and after I'm uh, done with political science, I'm planning to uh, start studying history, which is mainly th is history of IDs. Okay. Well, well, your, your channel has an emphasis on, on uh, addressing uh, common kind of uh, uh, anti-theistic arguments against, against Christianity. Uh, yes. Uh, I don't think it's to my knowledge, there's really no one's doing it like on a channel level. I know someone's yeah. done a video about it here and there, but it's no one really like puts main focus on it. And I don't think the people who really does videos about it, I don't think they have. Uh, I usually don't think they have uh, overall uh, really good sources to back them up. Like they use popular historians who not always have um, the best material or the best intentions. <clears throat> Mm, mm. Which is why you, when you see several of my videos that deal with science or religion, is that I always, uh, it's very clear with what literature I'm using and like when I'm quoting someone. And I also like to try to put the references down in the like the corner, so people can go and like see where what literature I'm reading at or which primary source I'm quoting. Yeah, because the uh, the uh, internet certainly has enough uh, amateur historians. So when oh, uh, you don't say, you don't say. <laughs> Well, like I get people on my channel, I say, "Oh, uh, can you can you address this guy saying this about about uh, uh, Jesus mythicism or something?" I always I always kind of a uh, uh, demur at that point because I'm like, "Well, there there are people better qualified uh, to address it than I'm." I usually like turn them to like Tekton TV or a channel like that. But yeah, I, I mean, I've I I understand that that for an amateur such as myself, I mean I mean I, <laughs> I don't want to put forward an authoritative opinion, you know. Yes, definitely, and I think I don't like it because I think most YouTube history channels are just some guy who just presents a narrative about the topic and then give no gives like no references or no discussion about it. Yeah. But, and I don't say like it's every it's every history channel, but like most I would say, and most of the big ones definitely. So did you uh, create your channel uh, uh, just as as a means of just kind of airing topics that are of interest to you, or, or, or do you feel that that certain currents in society kind of impelled you to to do that? Um... It's kind of an interesting way, a uh, story how how I started my YouTube channel because I wasn't generally very interested in history. I, w I was kind of like it was a sub interest uh, up till uh, I think uh, East uh, Autumn 2016, where I I was more interested in uh, philosophy uh, until then. But I realized I was not I was okay at philosophy, but I was not as good as I was in other subjects. And I remember I was watching a YouTube guy. I, I told this. I think yeah, this is the third time I'm telling it on a stream, a YouTuber called uh, History Buffs. And he's a British YouTuber with a team who does, uh, he's an interesting concept, he does historical movie reviews, uh, like historical um, movie reviews of uh, like movies then, yeah. and then rate them like under his historicity. And he was making a movie about a review on the movie Agora from 2009, which covers the life of Hypatia of Alexandria. And I remember he became very polemical in the second half of the movie, in my opinion, 
and he made many several claims at the end about like Christianity and the Middle Ages that was like I couldn't point out that, that they were necessarily false, but I will I could point out like sense that okay, there's several things that doesn't make sense. So um, I thought, I, why not? I don't I do my own research on this topic. So I went to the university library. I checked out okay who has written in these subjects, and I found uh, Maria de Sielska in when it came to Hypatia of Alexandria. Um, very good scholar has written a written a book on her from 1995. I also found out like uh, the Christianity's relationship to Greek philosophy during the uh, end of uh, the Roman. Yeah. Uh, Roman Empire and um, and let's just say short, keep it short that the more I read on the subject, the more false I found in this video. And we're not talking nitpicks; we're talking like big stuff. Like he's getting yeah. like scholarly consensus wrong, wrong. And I also thought like, okay, no one is going to respond to this. And um, the only really way that this would get response if was if I made a response because no, like. I like to speak of like history of science. It's an amazing topic to be interested in at in a university, because the university libraries are full of literature on the subject that no one's reading. <laughs> so I can yes. like borrow, yeah, I can borrow books and like keep them for two years or something because no no one else is reading them. Yeah, and um, so and somewhere in that, somewhere there, I got the idea. Why don't I make videos about it about the subject? Why don't I start my own YouTube channel? So yeah, that was basically what I did. I got iMovie. I started learning a bit about like tips and tricks on YouTube, and I made my first video covering the. It's the video like did Christianity destroy ancient science, where I debunked the myth that the early church was hostile to uh, classical philosophy and stuff. Yeah, stuff and yeah, and and I've been working from there. Like I started using Photoshop and After Effects and branching out to different subjects that I want to make videos about. Yes, yes. So, so you basically, uh, uh, you, you saw this video and, and you got the sense, uh, not that you knew he was wrong in fact, but you got the sense that what he was saying was motivated by an agenda, and which I mean, uh, not su suspect. I mean, everyone has a bias to some yeah. degree. I am biased myself, but I like I try to be make sure that even if I'm biased, I'm gonna what I'm gonna say is at least gonna be right. And um, history buffs, in my opinion, and I know he's uh, appeared on the B bad history Reddit thread where people like pick up things uh, where people treat history bad on the internet and like respond to it. And he has appeared there, I think, three to four times. I think one of his reviews, uh, one of the responses got taken down. Down and people there have pointed out, at least claimed. I can't make this claim because outside the, the movie Agora, I can't really. My expertise ends, you could say. Yeah. Uh, but people have claimed several times that uh, he often forces his own opinions on the reviews where movies he likes will usually be considered overall historical accurate with a few in with a few nitpicks, whereas movies he don't like will be nitpicked will be like nitpicked intensely, even down to like what hats people are wearing and what animals are in the background. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, makes so, and he also have one of those guys who he leaves no references, and he speaks of, of himself like he's studying primary sources, like he's studying the original source material. But he's so obviously just the research continue uh, consists of a few Google searches, obviously. Yeah, well, that's what I was gonna say. It's 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 kind of uh, amateur historiography, which is which is what you're really up against because everyone nowadays they see they see a YouTube video and they consider themselves an expert. Uh, yes, I think I think Crash Course World History is like the tip, like the main example of this, and Extra History also very bad. Mm -hmm. What like, was it, what? what? What were those uh, things you were telling me about? Um, I can send you a link to Real Crusades History's response video to one of Crash Course videos. Um, but those well, are just to be aware of. Yeah, and I think the general pro tip to when like you're judging like historicity on YouTube is at least what I try to is is the person like giving references, yes, or is it just someone like presenting a narrative? <laughs> yes, uh, the most I think notorious video was the one that they had ten years ago, Zeitgeist, which went oh, my God. viral and gave no citations for any of its claims. No, no, that's, I like when, I know I, Inspiring Philosophy made like, he's making a video series uh, 
responding to the claims made in that video. And he, at, I think at one time in one of the videos, one of his other video, he says, this was this claim was just made up of error by Mythicist. And it's like, well, IP, all of these claims are made up of thin error. Like, there's no foundation for any of them. And they've they've been drawing from the same well for for more than a hundred years. They they're just they're just all the mythicists just kind of appropriate from each other. Yes, yes, yes. And, so uh, um, I continue. Uh, no, I, I was just going to say, just like getting back to the uh, uh, phenomenon of, of new atheism, which which is what my channel is about, and, and kind of incidentally yours is about, but. Uh, uh, what what is your opinion of the of the new atheist movement in the present, uh, uh, in, in in Western Europe in the Anglophile world, and and where do you see it uh, headed in the in the years and decades to come? I can't say have a very, that I have like any good view on them because I don't follow them very much. Okay. Uh, as I understand, their movement is losing steam in general. Like they're they have already re already reached their peak and like. I think there's only like Sam Harris that re is really the only ones that's still relevant to some degree. I know because like, Christopher Hitchens is Hitchens yeah. is dead, and I don't think Dawkins. I know I want to uh, hide an idea about doing like making response video to either Dawkins or Harris, and yeah. I googled it and I saw that Harris was way more way higher up in search engines than Dawkins. Um, my general view of them is well, really. Uh, really low, I must say, both in philosophy and in history. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, how to say they? Uh, what was the question now again? Oh, I I'm just asking you wh where you see it headed in 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 the years and decades to come. Uh, I have no idea. I'm afraid. <laughs> okay, that's that's fair enough. Uh, interesting, you say uh, uh, Harris kind of survived. Uh, uh, by virtue of the fact that he was able to rebrand himself, I don't know if you see what he's doing nowadays, but but he's he's kind of become a, a, a this kind of guru guru rather who tries to meld a, a, a new atheism with kind of a weird new agey uh, mindfulness. If you ever heard about that, that's like a yes. big America mindfulness, and so he's like trying to merge them, and so that's he's trying to find some sort of third way. But yeah. he, he did it by kind of crawling out from under the shadow of, of, of the four horsemen. And, and I really think that people overestimate the, the importance of the, of the kind of uh, uh, heavy hitter new atheists. Because as an intellectual movement, uh, uh, new atheism was dead on arrival. I, I mean, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. <laughs> you can tell just reading uh, uh, The God Delusion, okay, there's, there's nothing here. So, so new atheism as an intellectual movement died in like 2006 because it was dead on arrival. But, yes, but that was never that was never. Uh, uh, I don't think they were ever that influential in motivating the internet atheists. Maybe they gave them some ammunition, but I think the internet atheists just really want to be atheists in any case. So they have their own little culture. They have their own uh, uh, little set of of talking points that they kind of bandy about between each other. No, I think they had more influence than than that, actually, to be honest. Because I think is that, you know, most people in philosophy, this was certainly true for me really up until my, my until I became 19 and 20, was that uh, most people like me up to then don't know anything about stuff like philosophy and history or history, history, unless you specialize in those subjects. Yes. And I think that creates a kind of a space where, where it's, easy for someone who is an authority in one, in one subject to present themselves to be an authority in, in another subject and give like a general narrative that um, is plausible on the surface and that um, kind of corresponds uh, like a lot of people like it a lot for example I always wonder like because I when I speak with Christians who like to cite Rodney Stark a lot and I wonder like okay why, why do you cite Rodney Stark wouldn't you like to cite someone like more Cred uh, credible like Peter uh, Peter Harrison or like David Lindbergh or you know John Hedley Brook who are scholars, and then I it dawned on me that you know to really cite those people is that you really need need to learn so much background information on a subject. Like when you're talking about you know science during the Middle Ages, it's like what are we even talking about when we're saying science during the Middle Ages? What methods are we talking about? What theory? 
theories are we talking about? What like motivation for the science are we talking about? And uh, most people don't, I think, don't think have the interest or really the time to delve deep into it. And uh, so it kind of creates a, what's it called, kind of a space where um, people can write like their own small narratives on 200 pages that is very easy to understand and very like, how to say it, almost like it corresponds very well to certain people's like perceived worldviews. Yeah, yeah, well, they're starting with their conclusion and then just choosing, choosing the evidence and the methods that would support their conclusion. Oh yeah, that's definitely true for the new atheist treatment of history. To say. Yeah, well, when you were talking about method, it, it reminded me of something. Again, I, I kind of, I kind of demur any any discussion of, of history on my, on my own channel. But when when atheists uh, uh, say, you know, if Jesus existed, well, Jesus mythicists say this more specifically that when uh, uh, if Jesus existed, we should have uh, plenty of records of him from the first century. <laughs> it's like okay why does it just seem that way to you i mean well what is what is what are you comparing this to but they're just making an argument that it seems to them that there should be all, all this abundance of, of of contemporary first century uh records of jesus when when they don't know the methods that historians use to determine things like these and they have no points of comparison yeah yeah definitely definitely true so uh, what's it called? Also, it's something I realized with because I'm because I'm reading currently reading Board and Painters, uh, the New Atheist Denial of History, which is a book that I recommend you pick up if you have the time. Yes. And he points out that a lot of both Dawkins, Harris, and Hitchens is they treat um, kind of they treat history in the, essentially the same way that in the in a bad way of treating science. Because in history, you start with a question, and then you and you start with a neutral question. And then you look at all the evidence and you try to draw a conclusion and give an answer to that question. You know, and similar to science, you start with a problem, you look at all the evidence, then you draw the conclusion from the evidence. They, on the other hand, start with a conclusion and then they try to f make the evidence, well, like cherry pick the evidence to make it fit that conclusion. And you can see it very, Borden Painter points out, like you can see it very clearly with, when, with uh, in the reference points, like the either side, um, scholarship that are pretty outdated uh, like people who are by have no credentials in the field whatsoever like they cite activists the most <laughs> funny example is that they cite each other as historical authorities authorities and uh, probably the worst case is when they take a uh, current scholarship and they kind of try to twist it uh, to make it fit uh, their own perceived notion and i know born and painter gives an example of uh, um, the papacy's uh, um, relationship to the Third Reich and the Nazi, yes. Nazi regime, and I know he picks up, uh, points out that Hitchens uh, cites uh, cites a I don't know if, sure if it's an article or like a book uh, called Hitler's Pope, where I'm not and I don't remember the name of the scholars, where the scholar basically argue for argues for something like, well, the papacy didn't do as much as they could have done. To help the Jews who were persecuted in the in the Third Reich in the by the Nazi Germany, and then he uh, Hitchens start, draws the conclusions from that that the skull that the source he's citing is arguing that the papacy was actively uh, supporting uh, the yes. Nazi regime, yes. which is complete like it's a non sequitur, and it is distortion. Didn't uh, uh, many of these of these kind of uh, uh talking points uh did they not have their origin kind of in stalinist propaganda uh, I, I have no idea actually the idea that the vatican was somehow in cahoots with the third reich uh they probably said that at some point but i, I have no idea i'm and when it comes to like the origins of certain ideas i know where the origins of the conflict thesis starts but i don't know the origins of like the uh, the papacy apparently supported the third right stance it could have a right it could have a, come up anywhere Yes, like you know, people cite stuff like, okay, you know, uh, on the like the Nazi soldiers spell to stand, God is with us, which, <laughs> which is something you will hear from like a YouTube comment section. But I've yeah. seen people quote it in debates. Yeah. So, so. You the uh, the conflict thesis and, and uh, that that just began at the end of the at the end of the nineteenth century. Nah, not really. It's uh, it has a longer history than that. 
Well, uh, it really, uh, to give the short story, it really starts at the Reformation, where Protestants uh, start talking about the Catholic Church and it's like holding society back, it's being oppressive. And uh, I know Peter Harrison even gives the scholar even gives like an example, gives this really fun example that before you know the idea that Christianity caused the Dark Ages, before that idea came along, Protestants had come up with the idea that the Catholic Church caused the Dark Ages. Dark Ages. So yeah. even before like the uh, thinkers, like the secular thinkers and critics of religion, like Voltaire, Edward and Edward Gibbon and Denis Diderot. Yes like started to give these talking points of like Christianity holding science back back and stuff, the dark ages and stuff. There was already this uh, bigger narrative that he could just pick up, pick up and such. And it also fitted in, in with a lot of their, uh, their pre uh, perceived notions about the cause of history. Because I'm not sure if, are you familiar with August Comte? Uh, uh, a little. You heard the name, maybe. But he had this idea of, like, history is in different stages. Like, the, we start with the religious stage, stage where, like, Zeus is walking on, walk, like, the gods causes everything. Then we walk over to the metaphysical stage where we have, like, abstract principles to explain stuff. And then in the end, we walk over to the scientific stage, which Comte argued that they had reached then in the early uh, 19th century. And yeah. the conflict thesis fitted very neatly with that uh with that narrative but it doesn't really so there is the conflict thesis definitely shows up before the late uh, 19th century but it doesn't really but it doesn't really like uh takes on into the academy of history until the late 19th, 19th century by and i know the scholar run on numbers in his book galileo goes to jail points out that it was mainly done by two people who had who were secular thinkers and critics of religion who had had very pers bad personal experience with Christianity, yeah. Christianity, and um, and he lifts up first as uh, the uh, the guy John William Draper, who was a chemist, chemist, um, very good scientist, I think, not good historians, and he wrote a book called uh, "The History of the Warfare Between Science and Religion." That in Christendom. exactly like modern times. You you have uh, uh, scientists who who are completely out of their elements in history, writing about history. Oh yeah, of course. This is not a new thing. Yeah. Uh, and he basic that book is basically one big rant against the Catholic Church, and he <laughs> yeah. doesn't speak much about Islam or Protestantism. Then. And then we have a guy called Andrew Dix uh, Andrew Dixon White who writes another oh, book yeah. called "The History of the Warfare Within Science and uh, History of Warfare Between Science and Theology Within Christendom." Where he um, makes up a lot, and this it's specific, specific, specifically, uh, specifically from this book that a lot of like the many p talking points that we hear today originates from, and um, several things were things that he just had made up or drawn from very like he had drawn very dubious conclusions from uh, stuff that really didn't show it. And I know Ronald Numbers talks about this in their interview at UGIF, which is a research center in Brazil. And um, he talks about many people were probably like skeptical to the narrative, but it was at the same time very, many people liked it at the same time. Because in the 19th century, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of anxiousness, a lot of like questions about religion, a lot of fear for certain religious groups, especially Catholics in the United States. Yeah. States. So the whole warfare thesis, even if people probably were skeptical to it, was that they liked it still. Yeah. Still. And it resonated with many thinkers back then. And that is really why it kind of took on and why it's been in scholarship really until the 1970s when a new generation started to really question it and later to in the mid 80s to reject it altogether. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, because it, it fit with a lot of people's agendas to uh, to put forward this narrative. Mm, definitely. Now, uh, uh, how has let's let's uh, certainly uh, uh, one of the one of the arrows in their quiver is is the case of Galileo. So so when did that become really a, a, an important kind of talking point for them? Hmm. How many hours do I have to talk about Galileo? Because <laughs> <Okay, they, sorry. laughs> no, it's okay. Because I've tried to make a Gal video about Galileo three times, and I always put it on ice because I never think I really get enough aspects. It's yeah. always like like the core center ideas bit, but there is much 
much more discussions about Galileo than what's it called um, than I would like it to be. Uh, I like scholarly consensus. So, but the Galileo case really starts with really directly after Galileo's Spenum trial. Because it's, as I said earlier, it is with the Protestant Reformation that this idea of the Catholic Church as oppressive and like, dogma, uh, like dogmatic holding science back, holding freedom back uh, really appears. I think it's really like 1640 or something like that when the Galileo kind of legends start to grow. grow. And uh, uh, should I, do you want me to like try to give a quick overview of the Galileo case and what what's people find? Uh, it would be useful, yeah, just, just a brief overview. Okay, so I think we really need to start in the uh, 30, uh, 14th century with um, um, with uh, two astronomers called John Bird and Nicholas Resmi, and they were discussing about theory, new theories of motion that challenged the Aristotelian theory, and they didn't discuss, uh, they also discussed the Earth, Earth's motion, motion, and they didn't like discuss whether the Earth is revolves, revolves around the Sun, but they did discuss if the Earth was revolving around this axis. And that's very important, because the whole Galileo case, this is also a misconception. People usually think about where the, like, the Earth's location in the universe, but that was not what the dispute was about. The dispute was simply about whether the Earth, the Earth was moving or not. Or not. So, and uh, John Bird, to get back to John Bird and Nicholas Resmi, they excuse me, they uh, discussed this and theorized this and spoke with like, like this is a real theory. And did, they did so really without any fear of persecution. Mm. Persecution. As did Copernicus. I mean, I mean, there was yes, no as did Copernicus. Yeah. And then, but he rejected the theory. Like it, the thing with the early Copernican theory was that it didn't fit well with the evidence, but it was very, uh, very beautiful theory in that it could explain many things with a uh, few causes. So I, I don't want to cut you off here, but I think I think we need to underline this point because it was it was believed that the the Copernican theory, what that the uh, I'm sorry the Ptolemaic uh, cosmology was supported by strong evidence. It was. Oh like, yes, yes, definitely. I think Peter Harrison points out something like that that by year 1600, like six, 60 years after Copernicus has been published. Less than ten people in Europe think that Copernicus, the Copernican model, is right. Yeah, right, and that well, it was that. It uh, was not religious faith versus evidence. That that no. is a way of framing the issue. No, but we will get to the religious faith okay. and evidence then. <laughs> but um, um, but then the whole uh, the thing starts changes with Galileo uh, when he invents the uh, telescope in 1610, and he looks about looks at the, uh, at the stars, and it, one of the things he sees is that the moon has craters, and it's not a perfect sphere, which really is the death blow to Aristotelian cosmology, and really opens the door for a kind of new cosmology and a new physics, in which the Copernican model can be coherent. Coherent, And um, uh, during, but ha here's the thing though, before this time, a big movement, a big shift that happened in European religion, and that was the Protestant Reformation. And one of the central themes, uh, disputes in the Protestant, between the Protestants and Catholics was, of course, biblical interpretation. And not just about what the right interpretation is, but also who has the right to interpret scripture, scripture whether it is the Catholic Church or is it like a more decentralized model. And what that basically caused was a kind of lot of stigma. I'm not sure if we can say conservatism, but people were very strict, much more stricter than what they had been in the like the 14th century about what the right uh, interpretation is. Because of course, if the Catholic Church uh, can be like in a conflict, uh, be held as credible when it comes to biblical interpretation, uh, the church need to be clear on what the interpretation is. During the like the High Middle Ages, the church didn't have to think about that at the same in the same way, because they were what's it called? They were not challenged when it came yeah. to biblical interpretation. So it created a lot of I, I don't have the right word for it, but you probably know what I'm talking about. Well, it was it was also uh, uh, kind of thrown out to people not in their own vernacular language. So yes, might not have been an issue. Yes, so. What, uh, what we, where, where were we? Um, so that created a lot of tensions. And um, when Galileo then published his, I think it's called the Assayers, uh, which is his works that defeats, uh, what's it called? Uh, Aristotelian, the Aristotelian cosmology. cosmology uh, it creates a lot of tension within the Catholic Church. And two factions arose, arises. 
One that goes with more dogmatic, like it keeps to the traditional view, which is that these uh, Bible passages, which uh, touches on the uh, motion of the earth, uh, are literal, and which would imply that the earth is stationary. And another uh, movement. The earth is yeah, fixed. Yeah, it's fixed and it's not moving. And then another movement that doesn't say that the earth is moving, but it says that the script but the scripture but it says that the scripture don't imply that the earth is moving. And they were drawing on stuff like uh, ideas from Augustine and I th no, mostly Augustine, not Aquinas so much, I think, about biblical interpretation. And that uh, given certain circumstances, the Bible was not meant to be taken literally, but rather metaphorically. And uh, I, I, I also just want to say when when you read like uh, the book of Job, it's just a beautiful poetry. But what I have noticed, I'm not a biblical scholar, is that whenever it, it talks about the fixity of the earth, it's always in close proximity to describing God's moral authority. Okay, so, I don't know much about that, but okay, that was so. And unfortunately, the uh, the side that uh, said that the earth was fixed uh, was. Uh, one in the end in 1615, uh, partly because uh, that was the traditional view that the church had been with, and also because the Copernican model was still a, a small minority among astronomers. Yeah, astronomers. So they went out and what's it called? And um, Galileo had to be silent then because he couldn't teach the. He could teach it as a theory, but not as a actual like not a real re realistic theory, but rather as a mathematical model. And um, let's see what happened. Well, like and a, then a Sean Carroll cosmology that no one actually believes, but it's just kind of thrown out there. Yeah. Uh, it's beautiful fictions that we make up to now. Um, and then later, Galileo got in trouble. Before it really happens, a lot of things because in, then it's later in um, 1633 that uh, Galileo is faced by the Inquisition, and it's due to him uh, a new pope is being elected, uh, Pope Urban, I think the eighth. Also, I think, and who was a good friend of Galileo, Galileo, and who was rather neutral when it came to biblical interpretation in astronomy, astronomy, and um, Galileo then took uh, took his like uh, at, like saw his like what's it called um, possibility to uh, convince the papacy that uh, yeah Copernicanism is true and what's it called that. Um, What's it called? Copernicanism is true, and that the Bible is those passages are not meant to be taken literally. That the Bible don't imply that the earth is stationary, and he wrote a kind of a dialogue book, book between three people. One of them was a Copernican, one who was a um, Ptolemaic, uh, uh, as Aristotelian Ptolemaic astronomer, and then one a third person was neutral. And they like, and through that, he kind of used a Platonic dialogue form to discuss different ideas and give it, like two sides giving arguments, and they see where the argument leads. Yes. And uh, he said some the, unkind things about the Pope. Yes, uh, not to say some things kind, of kind things about the Pope, but he uses arguments that he has gotten from the Pope. And place it in place it in the mind of the Aristotelian, and the Pope didn't like that because yeah. the book was very polemical. It was very one-sided, and it was basically that the Copernican won every argument. So when the Pope, uh, when the book got out, it got through the Vatican uh, censor, censor, but it was quickly put back again after a few months. And it is reports that the Pope was furious when he read the book, and which was likely due to that an argument that he had. But which was basically the argument was basically like, well, whatever model we use, use uh, we can never be sure that it's about the universe. We can never be sure that it's true, because God could easily have ordered it, ordered it another way. Which is like, yeah, philosophically abstract, philosophically sound, but not very scientifically sound. And uh, Gelli had put that argument in the mouth of the Pope. Pope and. Um, so he was called in down to the Vatican uh, to put on trial for teaching uh, Copernicanism. Copernicanism, and important enough, important enough is that while he was there, there were a lot of groups in the Vatican that wanted him away for other reasons. One, I think, the prime group is the Jesuit astronomers, because he had the, the Jesuit astronomer had uh, kind of cherished him when he released his uh, book, the Isaiahs, in 1610, but. Uh, one uh, Jesuit astronomer called Grassi 
had, um, I think around 1620 or 1623, had uh, made a discovery that, what's it called? That he had uh, saw that an atom, uh, what's it called, asteroid was flying and it was above the moon. The moon. A comet? Yeah, yeah, a comet. That's right. It was above the moon, which contradicted Galileo's theory that comets were mere like optical illusions that happens um, below the moon. So he responded uh, to Grassi and he wrote a very polemical piece, piece of paper that, uh, what's it called? That essentially not only attacked Grassi as a person, but also the Jesuits as an organization. And I think he uses like very rude words, like he called Grassi a viper and a scorpion almost. And he calls the Jesuits like, uh, you can't do science, you just believe things in the 40, you can't follow the evidence. Um, so, and that was the case of Jesuits. They wanted them pretty much away from the public space after that. And um, I know there are other examples that I don't remember that well, but let's just say that by 1633 or 1632, I'm not exactly sure what year it was, uh, when he was on trial, there was a lot of groups that wanted him away. Yes. Way. And he got... Um, he got very well treated during the trial. He was not thrown in jail. He was not tortured. He probably didn't fear for his life or anything, uh, which I want to go in that. Luxurious house arrest, yes. Yes, he was first living at the Tuscan embassy, and then he was living in his prosecutor prosecutor's six-room apartment uh, with a servant who brought him meals twice a day from the Tuscan embassy. embassy. And he was found guilty for teaching Copernicanism, and he was what's called, uh, and he was sentenced to house arrest. Uh, under the uh, in a castle outside Florence, Florence, we, where he could still publish and stuff, but he was not allowed to move from there. At least what I know. Mm -hmm. No. So, what are the kind of the main things to um, take away from this? Uh, one is that this is not the Galileo case is an uh, anomaly. It is not res uh, like representative for the Catholic Church or Christianity's general historical relationship between. Uh, with natural philosophy and the natural sciences. Uh, two, there were many factors. Galileo himself was a very problematic person who, who was, and now this is what the number said, who had a very good habit of alienating both his friends and enemies. Mm -hmm. And also, it um, the Galileo case is, you know, it's, it's basically been like the legend about the relationship between like science and religion or science and Christianity because like when you think of science and Christianity almost all people almost directly think of Galileo yes, yes. but he's not representative and the case doesn't represent the general case uh, the general uh, relationship between the Catholic Church and natural philosophy because I know a book and so I know both Peter Harris and the role of numbers have pointed this out and they use a quote from a book from a scholar called scholar called uh, John Heilbrum, who is not a Catholic and not a Christian either, I think, and certainly not a apologist for the Vatican, who's pointed out that, and I think he's written a book called The Son of the Church, which kind of um, uh, studies the Catholic Church relationship to astronomy, where he, says, where he starts off the book by declaring that the Catholic Church as an institution, what's it called, gave more support, social and economical support to the study of astronomy from the high, uh, uh, it was called the 12th century Renaissance in the 12th century into like the age of the enlightenment than any other and all other institutions in Europe combined. Mm -hmm. So it's not an ideal situation. And it you know, there's definitely kind of like a conflict between like freedom of thought and maybe the institutions and like certain parts in the Catholic church. We must remember that there were other parts who supported Galileo and, um, so yeah, it's a complicated story and not uh, res re what's it called representing the historical relationship between science and Christianity. Well, this is, uh, actually, this is actually a good segue because I was going to say, yeah, well, the Catholic Church was obviously the 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 uh, custodian of all Greek thought, including Greek philosophy, including a, a Greek astronomy, you know, in Ptolemaic thought, and in bringing it uh, into the Middle Ages and and, and such, but. And that kind of segues into uh, uh, the relationship of, of the church and the Dark Ages. Is, is it possible to do this briefly? Uh, what do you want me to talk about? <laughs> the, the myth that the uh, uh, Christianity plunged Europe into the Dark Ages. 
Uh, it's a myth. It's uh, universally rejected by all scholars today. Uh, good night. <laughs> <laughs> or how many hours do I have? Uh, <laughs> <that. Yeah. laughs> okay, let's just make a few claims about them. If you want to say the Dark Ages, I can say like in Western Europe during after, directly after the fall of the Roman Empire up to the 12th century, can be called, or like the Carolingian uh, Empire in the 8th. 800s can be called the Dark Ages. There was a lot of political instability, uh, a lot of security that went away for a lot of people, and like a lot of barbarism, a lot of like people, uh, groups of people wandering and violently taking power in different places. And well, essentially all except the thing that was preserved in the monastery of ancient thought was like disappeared from Western Europe. Not necessarily because people. Um, what's it called? Because like the manuscripts were lost, but because the manuscripts were written in Greek, and as you probably know, that during after the fall of the Roman Empire, almost there was almost no one left who could read and write, and the most of the people who could read and write were from the church, and they could only read and write in Latin. Yeah. So the only thing they had left were things in Latin, which was usually handbooks. Like there was Galen's work in medicine, there was um, Plato's Ptolemy. Uh, What's called Timaeus, which is a work in astronomy, uh, Aristotle's uh, logic and dialectic, uh, logic, logical works, and something more. And that was all they had for really up until the 12th, 12th century Renaissance. Then, during the 12th century Renaissance, we see a tr formation of a new Europe and uh, a really not golden age, I would say, but really I like civilization drawing itself up from the Dark Ages in the early Middle Ages. Mm. Ages. And we see stuff like the rise of the universities, which are something completely new, at least in Europe. I'm not sure about the Middle East, but at least in Europe, there's a completely new, new. We see the translation movement, which is something that is unprecedented in history. Just idea that like medieval Europeans thought that like there was knowledge that we don't have that is in other countries, and we need to travel there and learn from them and like and get this. And get it back to our, like to our continent, to and in, incorporate it into our worldview. Do Do you think I'm just throwing this out there? Do you think uh, uh, maybe Protestantism was instrumental in that? Um, well, I'm talking about the High Middle Ages, so yeah, I'm okay. not sure about Protestant. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I yeah. think I said in the beginning that I mostly focus on the Middle Ages and antiquity. I may be able to answer that question like later, but not now. Okay, not in the stream. Um, and what we basically have is. We also have what's called the Gregorian Revolution during the High Middle Ages. Are you familiar with that? No. The Gregorian Revolution is essentially the church liberation from the secular powers. Because during the early Middle Ages, the church had essentially been subordinated to the like lo local lords and kings, kings, and like in the sense that um, the kings had their own bishops and they could like decide where they like if they would want to keep them or not keep them and like the vatican yeah sure it had this small political entity in italy but other than that the church just you know it had cultural power but didn't have any like political or economical power but yeah. then after the fall of the frankish empire uh, founded by uh, charles the great great in the 10th century there's a lot of like decentralization of political power in europe and what happens in that time is that a lot of the monasteries and like church buildings uh, become autonomous. They like they get their own land, their own pl property that is what's it called, independent from the local lords. Lords like the local lords can't take it from them. Uh, so what that happens is also that it's like an embassy almost. Yeah, you know, almost an embassy. Like it has their like the Vatican has lands, start gaining land all over Europe. And a lot of peasants give their land to the to the Catholic Church, because when this uh, the power is decentralized, um, uh, there's a lot of conflict between like warring lords and uh, lords and nobles, and they don't care about the uh, the common peasants that much. So what the peasants, <clears throat> for their own safety, what they, many of them did was that they gave their land to the church, which benefited both them and the church, because the church got more money, more like more land to tax, more like uh, nature and more food. food, And um, peasants got a kind of security that they didn't, couldn't get achieve otherwise, because the church land was not allowed to be attacked by the secular nobility. So th that essentially is like called the Gregorian Revolution, when the church, it stopped being subordinated to 
the Lords and Kings, and it's, it takes a place uh, besides it, where you have like, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the talk in the Middle Ages, that like, yes, there is the secular power, like the royal power, and then there is the church besides it. Besides it. And this creates uh, one of Europe's first international organizations called the Catholic Church, that is not bound to any specific uh, state or country country so and we also see this kind of new international culture in europe you know it's kind of interesting we speak of internationalism during the middle ages mm. ages where we have a lot of different states they we don't have an empire but a lot of different states and they're all tied together by this common christian catholic identity and by latin like we have so we have the rise of the universities which were not founded by the catholic church much we said they were like more founded as kind of guilds but they got in under the protection of the Catholic Church, and with the kind of like the universe, the new Christian uh, kind of new Christian, uh, or I don't know what's called new, but like when you in, uh, like Christian international identity, like we have people who there's a much a greater exchange of information. You know, someone like Thomas Aquinas, who's born in Italy, can get a degree in uh, theology and philosophy at the University of Naples in Italy, and then go work with those degrees at the University of Paris, which was the, what's it called, the intellectual uh, center oh, in medieval yeah. Europe. So we see a whole new, what's it called, um, exchange of information and a whole new like internationalism, which, I mean, it's called the Dark Ages. <laughs> it's, why do you, we call this the Dark Ages? It's like, yes, it's yeah. amazing. And, and, and uh, the progress of science uh, never stopped, really. No, I don't know. Stopped. It's. I think Tim O'Neill said it very good uh, when he's discuss like a debate with or comment debate with. He's in a lot of uh, forum debates with Charles Freeman, where he said like the Western mind did not close during the Roman Empire uh, during the fall of the Roman Empire. It just had to think about the other things for a while. Yeah. yeah. And then it got back right back up up again. By the way, we should point out that Tim O'Neill has a, has an excellent blog. Oh yeah, absolutely. The history of Arabia is like. Man, I I love him as personal too. Like he, he's such a douchebag in one sense, but he's so funny. <laughs> so check out history for atheists and all. History for atheists. Go click it. Not now, but after you watch this, go click it. So, so yes, uh, uh, that was uh, uh, one thing. I, I we we hit the uh, the the conflict thesis, uh, uh, the fall of the Roman Empire. And do you just want to uh, touch on Jesus mythicism here? Uh, sure. I think actually you're more familiar with this subject than I am because I only like seeing videos on it. But can you talk about the subject for once? No, I really can't. That's what I'm saying. Whenever anyone asks me about it, I say, look, there are people who are qualified uh, to discuss the, the emergence of this idea. But again, I think, I think it, it has it, its origins. Not, not its origins, but, but it's kind of a, a propagation uh, in the in the late nineteenth century, by by certain interested parties, I think we can um, summarize it like this: There are people who can think, and then there are New Agers, Afrocentricist, and Richard Carrion and Oran Ra. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, but like it's so off the wall, and this is such a thing that like you can refute this stuff with a Google search in five minutes. Yes, if you actually are searching for. For like, if you actually are searching with an open mind or are interested in answers, because like, uh, it's so it's so dumb. I, I don't know if you remember because inspiring philosophy made when I'm he's made his uh, Jesus versus horse videos. I don't know if you remember it, but he's when he posted it in his Facebook page, the comment section blew up. Like it got like five thousand comments, and it yeah. was so off the wall and so disturbing almost because people were saying the most weirdest stuff, thing like. There was a lot of race baiting, also. Yeah, so I didn't know that like, African Americans had these sort of like conspiracy theories and stuff. Because, I mean, it was just all sort, all kind of weird. Like people it was New Agers, anti theists Afrocentrists. So, there there are, are are disturbing currents. Uh, yeah, uh, I I almost want to do a hangout with someone just just to discuss the the kind of black nationalist, uh, 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 black I Israelite. There there are all these weird factions, uh, all with their own motivation. I I kind of see uh, kind of the new atheist movement using these different kind of guises 
to scoop up groups of people who might not otherwise be interested uh, in their kind of agenda. But yeah, uh, uh, crazy stuff. I mean, if, if you want to look at it, look up uh, uh, the 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 uh, nation of, of Islam or, or the 5% nation of Islam, they believe crazy stuff. And, and it's also, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, that the the uh, 12 tribes of Israel that you read about in the Bible were not the current day Jews. They were current day people of color who kind of got scattered in the diaspora. And there's, there's been a historical fiction where, where these, the Jews that we know today were somehow supplanted. It was some sort of historical switcheroo. It is vicious. It is a viciously racist, anti-Semitic belief system. Yes, it's like, I know it because I read, I studied a summer course in Egyptology in 2016, and I remember what it was called, because there is this, it's also like with ancient Jews, it's also with ancient Egyptians that they were supposed to have been African Americans from the beginning, rather mm -hmm. than like, you know, people from the Middle East and stuff, uh, like, I don't know, I don't want to get in like eth ethnical stereotypes or anything, but like, it's all over the place, so... Yeah, and so I think uh, what's happening, uh, and again, some, some public figures, is that uh, new atheists are using uh, grievances to try to recruit people into their agenda. And one of their, uh, one of their grievances, I realize this is far away from, from probably anything you want to discuss, is that they use grievance about, about the, the, southern, uh, the southern slave, plantation slavery and the North African slave trade and use that as a way of kind of crowbarring people into into atheism, which <laughs> doesn't make sense, but to say, hey, those people who were trading slaves were Christians, therefore you should be an atheist. Okay, oh. could you give some examples of that? Because that's not a subject that I'm very aware of, I'm afraid. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a demonic thing. It's, it's something you, you hear about popularly. Okay, so, could you maybe uh, like send me a link to something or after the hangout? Okay, okay, okay. Uh, 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 what's his name? Cult of Dusty did a video that touched. Oh him. yeah, yeah, that guy, the the sudden guy who screams into the camera a lot. And... Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I love I love how you yeah, identify. I'm just even excited to those I'm serious. I can't. I can't. I'm gonna horror shit like. <laughs> That's what he sounds like. Do that. Do that. I want to hear that. <laughs> no, uh, uh, I seriously can't sit through five seconds of his video it's like it's like fingernails on the blackboard to me so yeah. i can't click on his videos <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. so I, I mean that's that and it goes into the, my point is that is that a lot of group well new atheism in general in these various guises use uh these kind of grievances to try to recruit people to atheism they use bad history they use historical canards that what they will not do is actually like prove God does not exist. They will they will try to say, oh, because you belong to this group, uh, 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 you should be an atheist. Because we can accuse Christians in history of doing these bad things, therefore you should be an atheist. Uh, never, it's not doesn't really follow. If this, then this. There's no logical connection. But they're they're really just trying to aggressively uh, kind of crowbar people into into atheism. Uh, can I ask you a question, uh, DA? Um, I'm more into history than philosophy, and you know, at least when I do videos, I think references are very important. I don't know about like apologetics and philosophy videos, how important references are, but I've seen some like many like how to say I'm not in what is I much anymore, but I mean, we usually I mean remember I, oh, excuse me, I'm something in my throat. I remember I usually like seen uh, seen stuff where like. They will just, especially these like popper stuff, like what's it called, logic, and uh, yeah. where they will just throw out claims without any real argument about it. Like they will just throw out definitions for like you know what is is atheism, a belief or lack of belief, and there's no real justification for it. Go for it, and um, I, I don't know, like uh, I don't. I, I can't. I'm sorry, I can't give an example right now on the top of my head. I, I, I understand what you're saying. Well. Uh, I will. I will say this: is that yeah, they they have these very uh, imposing title, logic, essence of thought. You know, it's it's all you know, cosmic skeptic. It's it's all very impressive sounding. Rationality rules. Rationality rules. You know, the, 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 um, debunked. It's all been debunked. Yes. But uh, what what you will find is that there's no content there. 
all uh, their arguments, such as they are, uh, are excuses why they don't have to prove anything they say. And their, their justifications, their rationalizations for why they don't have to prove their claims. But those justifications and rationalizations are themselves bald just assertions. Well, I think when you have like, because I want to remember that many of these channels, all they really do is response videos. Mm. Videos. And I remember, like, um, what's it called? Uh, Inspiring Philosophy had a video called, is where he argued that uh, theism was not caused by like abnormal brain function yes. and he used yeah. the definition of delusion. And uh, then this channel called, you know, what, what's it called? The Rational Channel, quote unquote, yes. um, made a response video where they said, oh, no, no, this is the definition. And yeah. then I think you had a stream with some other people and like you went back and forth. And then they kept doing response videos to it, <laughs> to it. And it's like, if you don't know what definition someone's using, why don't you ask them, like send a message and like let them explain and stuff. Like don't do videos back and forth. But I guess when all you really have to do or can do on YouTube is response videos, like, I guess it's better doing that. Yeah, well, also, I mean, uh, some of these people are making good money. So, uh, oh, yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, like, like Logic, uh, uh, I'm missing the mark, and I actually look, he makes, he makes $2,200 for every what? video. $2,200. Yes. Wait, yeah. how much is $2,200? That's like the same as in euros. That's the same as in euros, basically. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have euros in my country, but uh, $2,200. So it's like, is it's it like two thousand, two thousand dollars. It's it's like it's like if if you do ten of those, you could buy a pretty nice car. Yeah. Okay, so essentially, like an actual seller or something. Like. Yeah. No. Definitely. Definitely. Oh something. my god. <laughs> it's depressing, isn't it? So, yeah. So that's the thing is is that they're they they have they they put on a show they they kind of invent these dramas and 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 they're and they're doing it uh uh for money and. It, what strikes me uh, is is how boring their videos are. And it's not not only are they lacking in intellectual substance, they're boring. And it speaks badly of of the desperation of their audience to have their worldviews confirmed for them that they will sit through this person, uh, uh, you know, throwing their arms around and basically saying nothing just so they have that assurance that this person is, is saying that they're right they're they're the intellectual elite they're the intellectual vanguard and that they're special and yeah, so i think that yeah i think that's definitely the case for uh, at least some of them and i, I know like the messianic manic uh well, he's called manic or not and not maniac i think yeah and uh, i got that wrong i think it's a lot of his audience only gets philosophy from him like they don't even watch the response videos. That is absolutely the truth. That yes, because is... because I, I know several. I I don't follow his channels, but I seen like when he does response, like when some of he has responded to like inspiring philosophers videos, and he like and he res does a response video where he ignores half of the content. Like I remember he did a response video to IP's uh, argument for free will, and he started by like citing Ayn Rand, uh, and then he. Uh, presented something about quantum mechanics. I think like I don't rem I, I don't remember what it was because like I'm not into it. But I remember also he cited Alvin Plantinga a bit earlier. But TMM basically just took this segment with Ayn Rand and basically said, "Well, this proves no proves nothing." Like, mm, mm. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you, if you watch my video responses to him, but there there I don't was, watch them. There was a point at which he was responding to my video. And then he threw something from off the wall. I was talking about God as the creator of the world. And he said, well, God is a force. And according to physics, there are four fundamental forces. So if God exists, he would have to be a fifth fundamental force. Like, what? <laughs> it's like, that's that's the thing. It's, it's like deflection. It's it's like you're, you're chasing someone through an alley and they grab the garbage can and, and throw it in your path or something. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's a wild goose chase. And so, yeah, and it's like basically Richard Carrier style, where they can't admit if even if they've shown someone and shown he's he or her is wrong, they can never admit that they just ignore it and pretend they were right all along. Because that's what Richard Carrier do very often. Yeah, or or, or or pile it on so thick when there are so many 
wrong things to address that there's no way a person could address. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's actually very common in history forums. Because when I, like, I post my videos on some history forums, and there is someone who gets back, uh, sometimes gets back to me, who I'm not going to say his name, but, like, he posts like, first he starts, he starts with, like, civil responses where we go back and forth a bit. And then he starts writing, like, free essays of 10,000 <laughs> words each of, like, word pooping. And, like, just throwing primary sources, like, explain this, explain this. And you look at the, like, big, it is, like, it's so, it's, I mean, to go through them, like, takes days. Yeah. Literally, it takes days. Just finding the primary sources takes a long time. Time because you have to jump between different like what's it called uh, journals and like yeah. if they don't exist in your library you must find them at another library maybe you even have to buy them for x amount of cash and or something yeah and then they declare victory when people stopped responding yeah that's the thing I get I get like novel length response I'm like yeah I don't want I don't I can't respond to all of this but what what you said before uh, is that his uh, TMM's audience all they know of philosophy comes from him like I was arguing what I thought was basically a uh, pretty reasonable inference is that there is that there's a a mind external reality and all all the people in those comments were calling this a, a platonism I'm like that's not really what uh, uh, Platonism is. That they're just merely acknowledging that there is a reality that exists uh, uh, outside the mind. But just because everything they know is, is suckling at the teat of a TMM, uh, they just all just say that this is Platonism. Yes. Yes, and this uh, I can't understand it. Therefore, it's false. I'm not thinking, <laughs> even going to try to understand it, but. I can understand why this is the case. It doesn't make any sense to me. Yes, and and, and they will they will uh, they, will not, they will not even try to understand it. No, <laughs> it will not like because if I if someone like makes an argument to me and I I'm not like okay I'm not really sure what you're what the points you're making but could you maybe send me some like articles or links or literature where I can learn more about this that like that's a reasonable re response. Yeah. You don't just say like. Well, this is I don't understand. Therefore, it's false. Yeah, though they're 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 using their ignorance as an argument, which is precisely what they accuse uh, uh, us of doing. <laughs> but yeah, uh, like I I I dread. Uh, uh, I'm gonna do another response to TMM in time, but it sucks because I can't just take his last video uh, he did to me and just like drop it to the video editor and respond to that. I'm going to have to go back six videos and pick up every thread he dropped which is going uh, to be a, a grueling task i think you want to ignore it though you're just feeding him and giving him more things to do videos about exactly uh, he's, he's another professional atheist yes. yes i mean i think there's one i know the channel that i'm found in i have a f old friend from high school who watches him called the vegan atheist and uh, you may have heard about him yeah i think like uh no, I just love so how on the nose their their names always are. Yeah. Yes, and I think uh, what's it called? Um, I remember I watched this channel, like looked at this channel back in 2015. I think more than 50 percent of the videos he made, at least up to that point, was top 10 dumb comments I found in this video. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> videos. <laughs> so it's just response videos. Yeah. And it's not even trying to find like good arguments to respond to. It's like 10 dumbest comments about this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I mean that's that's what I see so much in atheism. It gets really tiresome is that, uh, yeah, they'll say, they'll make a thing, oh, here, here, there's a preacher out in Kansas who said this thing that's, that's, you know, evil or dumb or whatever. And they're just, okay, well, there, there are a lot of preachers out there. I mean, you, you could surely find one that said something offensive or stupid or whatever, but it, it just seems very cheap uh, uh, to do that. Just, you know, choose the absolute bottom of the barrel and just respond to that and say, oh, well, you know, this is the fault of Christianity or whatnot. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I just the more we talk, the more I think about Richard Carrier. 
this because I don't know if you read about him because but Tim O'Neill has an article from 2016 called Richard Carrier is displeased, which <laughs> covers the encounter. I don't know. Have you read it? No, I haven't. No, but <laughs> Carrier is like one of a kind person. You can basically say like uh, incredibly narcissistic. And uh, he's also sad in many ways because he was a guy who once upon a time had a very decent career as uh, academic career, but he unfortunately blew it by wasting away his time, like the indulg indulging in his full time hobbies of blogging and writing fringe books. That is way outside of his uh, field of expertise. You know, he actually has a PhD in history of science. Yeah. Interestingly. And uh, what's it called? And. Um, he, I mean, he has also written this monograph on the historicity of Jesus that is quote-unquote peer-reviewed. And I say quote-unquote because it was done by two people he knew. He has not revealed who these people are. <laughs> it's not been cited by anyone. And the, and the, what's it called? Uh, the book company, or like, I'm not sure if you can tell the genre, Phoenix. Yeah. It was uh, something at Brighton, or like at some okay. university. They have not revealed how the process went on when the it was period so it is fishy to say the least yeah and uh, no there's so many fun things this guy does uh, I, I mean he cheats on his own wife and he he spins stuff as coming out as a polymorphous person yeah yeah uh uh, uh he, he made a, a pass at rebecca watson i think it was something yeah that was a big thing yeah, but yeah. and he and i found it out because he wrote uh, writes it on his blog <laughs> That's one of those things. It's it's like Steve Shives. They they claim the polyamorous, but I, I always get the sneaking suspicion that this was a, a unilateral decision on the part of their wives. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. They they have been divorced, which is sad because they have been married for like seventeen years, and she is the one who has financially supported him. Yes, and basically allowed him to indulge in his full time hobbies of blogging and writing French books and stuff. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, that's the thing is, is when, when I see uh, uh, guys like Richard Dawkins, uh, 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 Sean Carroll, and stuff, they if they stayed within their little uh, narrow lanes, you know, they they could carve out. But they don't want to be a, a scientist or a cosmologist. They want to be a celebrity. They they want people booking them for appearances and paying them, you know, tens of thousands of dollars for speaking fees for being a professional atheist. <laughs> You know about that. Richard Carrier actually has become a wandering beggar because <laughs> he started the co what's called the Richard Carrier Exist Tour back in 2016, which yeah, basically yes. is that he's moving around in a like a big truck with his girlfriends, and he's begging people to host him as a speaker. <laughs> wow, that yeah, is. The, I'll send you the link when we're done. Like it's, I mean, it's it's so sad, really, because it can't be fun to be Richard Carrier. <laughs> Oh no! What what I like is all these all these skeptic organizations and they, they skeptic quote unquote yeah, yeah skeptic uh, uh capital S skeptic with a with a trademark after it with fedora uh, yes yes uh is that uh uh they will host oh here's an expert in the historicity of Jesus Richard Carrier and they'll get that side of like okay here's a guy he's like one of two guys with a phd who are seriously advocating this position and let's just hear his side of the story and that's their that's their skeptic approach to truth yes yeah, their skeptic approach it's so contra i mean it's so self-contradictory because i mean if richard carrier an unemployed blogger who basically is not taken seriously by anyone who has credibility in the field if this guy has to be your main go-to authority i mean it doesn't show your like your critical thinking it shows that you have become so entrenched into your own world into your own position position like I mean, it's it, they have become so off this. I mean, it the opinions yeah, have become so cool, dishonest yeah. and off the wall that no one else is willing to verify them. Yeah, uh, you were talking about peer review before. I don't know if if, if you remember this incident. This was a few years ago. Uh, Probably not. Rich Richard Carrier. Uh, 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 he said he was going to disprove uh, God by Bayesian reasoning. And oh so, yeah, I know about that. I heard, I not read what he written, but I read about that. And isn't the whole argument like it seems to me that if God exists, yes. this would be true? And yes, yes. 
Well, I, I mean, there there are Christian apologists who have used uh, Bayesian reasoning to try to argue for for the resurrection and whatnot. So he's trying to like say, okay, well, let's let's try to do it with this thing. And he said, okay, I'll be right back. I'm going to get peer review for this. <laughs> it never happened. Peer review, quote unquote. Yes, yes, yes. I'll, I'll give it. I'll give it to my drinking buddies. Yes. Uh, yeah, not, we don't do peer review to actually see if the argument holds. We just do peer review to be able to say it is peer reviewed. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, I will say this about Carrier. There is something uh, uh, perversely endearing about his his by hook or by crook attempts to get rid of that big band, Mister Jesus. You know, he's just he's just throwing things at the wall, and you got you got to almost admire his uh, his gusto. You know. Yeah, I mean, he even goes gone so far to declare Bart Ehrman to be literally insane for not accepting his position. <laughs> <laughs> that seems to be pretty common for atheists. They'll, they'll, they'll nah, say. it's common for Richard Carrier. I don't know about other people. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So I, I think I think we have we have done a good hangout here. I think this would be a good. Yeah, time. this was funny. Oh, yes, I very much enjoyed that, and it was actually a, a, a lot more substantive than I was kind of. <laughs> that I was kind of expecting, not on your end, but just for for a video on my channel. I thought it was. A, very informational, whereas a lot of videos on my channel are just kind of like ranting, but yeah. Oh uh, yeah, actually I wanted to give you a tip or like recommendations, because uh, I, I don't regularly follow your videos, but That's like fine. I check it some time. And something I noticed about it is that uh, it's kind of a critique because I've uh, f uh, had it, this problem with myself, not on YouTube, but like when argument with friends about stuff is that um, you sometimes assume that the people who you're uh, arguing with knows what you're talking about, but it's not always the case. To give an example, you know the guy was called uh, Coach Red Pill and his videos about yes. God and Santa? Uh, yeah, the video is dumb and uh, you pointed it out, but you never like explain, um, like explain to people what God actually is defined as. I don't remember I you that. do that in the video. And they, imagine like Coach Red Pill watching your videos and like, he basically says, okay, here's a guy, I made this claim, this guy says I'm stupid, but like, okay, well, what is God? That I never got that like, explanation. So several times, like, j just my bottom line is basically, don't always assume that people know, know like what you're talking about or like yeah. know the presuppositions and be more like, have them more like Jordan Peterson approach where you're the main purpose more to like explain and teach people stuff and not to like hit them on the fingers. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, well, I will say I, I said I I, I think you will do that a lot of anyway, but just please keep some balance to it. <laughs> okay. Nah, just because because I did say uh, uh, the view that God is 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 a timeless, immaterial creator of all. Uh, how did you say that? I maybe must have, I oh, may have missed that. What I should have said what I should have done uh, is actually reference like you know Aristotle and actually reference Bible verses that support this claim rather than just saying it's supported in Greek philosophy and the Bible. But it was not a it was not a serious video in any case. Okay, so it just. Yeah. Just a quick response video. Well, what I, I find and what I criticize myself about, and I'm kind of surprised no one has criticized me for, is that I, I never seem to decide who exactly my videos are addressed to. Are my videos addressed to Christians who, who, who are kind of looking for ways to kind of battle it out on the internet? Is it addressed to atheists? To try to persuade them to be Christians, it's all, my videos are always kind of thrown out into this middle ground, you know. Okay, I see. Um, may I ask? Do you have any? Because you you're a follower on my channel. You've been that since uh, day one, I think. Yeah. Uh, do you have any critique or like any idea of how I can improve my channels and my videos? Uh, no. I mean, I mean, I mean, unless unless you really want to get into like inspiring philosophy, like motion graphics and stuff. I mean. Uh, that, would, yeah. that would be it, but I mean, geez, I I cannot I cannot critique anything as far as substance goes. I mean, yeah, and it's like clear where the sources is taken from, and like it's actually clear that uh, people understand what I'm talking about. Yeah, well, you, you'd have to ask them, but yes, I I mean, you are you are you are you understand what I'm talking about at least. Fall. Yes, <laughs> I'm coming at this. I'm <laughs> I'm coming at this from a very different angle. I'm <laughs> just a little uh uh uh. Uh, pissant, who's just kind of like 
throwing his fist around. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, you know, before we end, because we're, we're going to end uh, like in not too long, uh, can I recommend some literature? Because I like to recommend literature for people who, when I'm in streams. Sure. Uh, and, on, on, I will post this uh, to the people at home. I will post this uh, in the in the description to this video. Yeah, sure. I will send a link when we're done with them. Uh, so first, we have documents or slash internet sources uh, that people can go into the links in the description and download them like right away. The first is Beyond War and Peace by Ron Dr. Ronald Numbers, uh, Professor Ronald Numbers, and the late David C. Lindbergh. It's a really good like introduction to the um, relationship. It's from 1986, and a really good introduction to the relationship between science and Christianity that covers like uh, science and Christian. I I've quoted it at least in my first video, and uh, uh, you don't even have to download it. You can find it on the internet. It quotes like it touches Galileo, evolution, what's called Christianity and ancient philosophy. So that's a good article. Another good article that is very similar is Science and the Christian Church from the Advent of Christianity to 1700 by David C. Lindbergh and the scholar Peter Harrison, which also teaches well, the history of the Christianity and science from the birth of Jesus till 1700, basically. And then in last internet source, uh, to the surprise of no one, is History of Atheists by Tim O'Neill. And uh, oh, and then we have books. Um, New Atheist Denial of History by Borden Painter. I assume a lot of like Christian apologists or like aspiring Christian apologists is viewing uh, following your channel. So, and I, this is a book I think many Christian apologists would like. Also, close with all say, that. Uh, you realize uh, Max Colbe, who I do the Hangouts with, he actually interviewed a uh, uh, a born painter on this channel. Oh, yeah, yeah I've seen it. I've yeah. seen it, definitely. Uh, Galileo Goes to Jail and Other Myths About Science and Religion by Ronald Numbers. It's an essential and 25 other scholars. It's uh, essentially a short ontology. It's my intro into the history of science and religion, essentially of short essays on eight to 10 pages, pages on like certain topics like um, science and uh, Christianity and uh, ancient philosophy, Galileo refuting the idea that claimed that Giordano Bruno was a martyr for science, yes. refuting the claim that Darwin destroyed natural theology, um, and as well as refuting some anti-scientific myths. Um, it's called, actually I have a quote from um, the book that I wanted to read. Um, you're okay if I read it, it will only take like one minute. It's from Noah Ephron, it, chapter nine called the myth that Christianity gave birth to modern science, where he critiques uh, Christians. And here it says, to be fair, the claim that Christianity led to modern science captures something true and important. Gen generations of historians and sociologists have discovered many ways in which Christians, Christian beliefs, and Christian institutions played crucial roles in fashioning the tenets, methods, and institution of what in time became modern science. And he also goes, uh, he also like, um, exp like I don't have time to like uh, evolve it really, but pick up the book, you will love it. Uh, every ch I love every chapter of it. Mm -hmm. uh, also, God's Philosopher by James Hannam uh, covers uh, history of the best popular book in the world, I would say, at least in Europe and America, on the history of a history of science uh, during the Middle Ages. Uh, and then we have um, something I a book that I like very much on science and religion. Science and religion, four hundred BC to AD fifteen fifty by Edward Grant, and it's similar to what my channel is about. It covers the relationship between science, mainly science and uh, Catholicism, um, Catholicism, uh, and uh, it has a shorter review on like five pages on science and the Byzantine Empire, science and religion in the Byzantine Empire, and science and Islam. And um, yeah, and those those are the books I have, and also the like people have good lectures on YouTube that I think more people would, I would like more people to view. And then the main people are Ronald Numbers and Peter Harrison, especially Peter Harrison have a lot of lectures that I think you would like, and a lot of people watching this. And also we have James Hannum who has a few good lectures on the history of science and history of science and Christianity. So, so that, those are basically the recommended li links and literature that I wanted to point to. Excellent. So, so uh, uh, you will send those to me after the chat. I'll put those in the description where where, where people can can read up.
Yeah, yeah, definitely. And if uh, you're a person who's watching this right now, um, feel free to subscribe to my channel or to Deflating Atheism channel. And really, like, because that is part of what I want my channel to be about. It's not just like people view my videos and then they then they take my word for it. But like, I really want people to go and because that's like you know in my last Hypatia of Alexandria video, you maybe remember that I ended with. You know, if you want to learn more about Hypatia, you should look up this these scholarly literatures, and they can be found in the description. So I want to people to like read more, basically. Yes, yes, I I, I certainly need to read more too, and especially uh, uh, yes. for me, history history is a real blind spot for me. I gotta be honest. So uh, yes, that's why I have my channel. So. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. So, so that's also an idea of what I want my channel to be about, to like be a kind of a tool to bridge the gap between the popular conception of the history of science and history of science religion and the actual scholarship on the subject. Yes, yes, because because like uh, it's uh, alarming how, how the academic world and the popular world don't even even touch each other a lot of times. No, it's and I especially documentaries. I've grown to hate documentaries. I hate documentaries so much. Unless it is a scholar who's actually have done scholarship in that subject and know what he or she is talking about. Any any particular uh, uh, any notorious ones you want, just want to mention by name? Uh, he's probably a good scientist, but he's horrible at history. Carl Sagan, obviously. Oh, Miller, yeah. Yes, he's Cosmos here, especially that because. I think I could probably have a much better view on Carl Sagan if I got got to him through like his science talks because I think it's good like explaining basic uh, concepts in science and theories. But what's it called? But when it comes to history, which is uh, how I, I came in contact with him, it's he cherry picks data, he draws conclusions from it that there is no foundation for. And he can't hold a critical distance to the subject several times, especially true for the history of science religion. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, I kind of give him the benefit of the doubt. You know, I'm obviously speaking about the Cosmos series from 2013. And based on what I've seen from him from interviews, I think he's just reading from a script. I don't think he knows anything of the subject. Yeah. And I don't think like he's even putting out his own opinions. I, I think it's Seth MacFarland who's really the main per perpetrator behind the bad history in that series. Yeah, somehow they saw fit in in the in the in the premiere episode to mention Giordano Bruno as, as if it were somehow a significant thing in in the, in the progress of science. Yeah, yeah, and add in their own opinions, of course. Yeah, basically every everything we've touched on in this discussion, uh, uh, the the I think the fall of Rome, uh, uh, the the you know Christianity, you know torpedoed science. Uh, you know, the Catholic Church said that the Earth was flat. Basically, all of those, I think, in modern times, uh, Carl Sagan was instrumental in, in propagating those myths. Yeah, so, yeah, definitely. Definitely. And especially with Sagan, because I know Tim O'Neill has a really good article on the Library of Alexandria, and he comments on the segment from Cosmos, I think episode 13, called Who Speaks for the Earth, where Carl Sagan talks about the Library of Alexandria. And he points out that Sagan it's obviously that he's twisting information that like he share picks information he have this like line of like great greek thinkers and inventors and they said these studied at worked at the library of alexandria they were even librarians and tim o'neill points out like with the exception of one who in the world worked there we have no evidence for any for that any of the other ones worked there yes and there's a, a is there a paucity of evidence that the Library of Alexandria even burnt down? Um, I would say more. I had a video about it that I took down due to rather embarrassing spelling errors. <laughs> <laughs> I'm planning to do a much more in substance video in the future. I think it can rank. I somehow made the older video rank. But what we claim that the Library of Alexandria never burnt, or yeah, yeah. Well, uh, no, I'm, I'm saying I'm saying that the 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 the, the evidence is not that strong. Um, the evidence doesn't really point anywhere right now. Uh, I think the majority consensus still is that Alex uh, Julius Caesar burnt it, but I know I read several articles pointing out that yeah, this it's possible, but the sources doesn't imply it. Mm -hmm. And I personally think that it didn't really like destroy in one cataclysmic event, but rather it, it was a gradual. Like it lost funding, there were earthquakes, that city was taken from time to time. 
And yeah. um, important with thing with Alexandria is the Alexandrian library was not its own thing. It was it was part of a building called the Alexandria Museum, which is kind of like an academic institution founded by the Ptolemaic dynasty. And the Alexandria Library was essentially just a just a quote unquote book collection that was associated with it. And before anyone asked, no, it was example. yeah, yeah. And before anyone asked, no, it was not five. It did not contain five hundred thousand five hundred thousand scrolls at this point, high point. Because this also a lot of claims. If they had to imply that the things that need to be true for that to be that that need to imply for that claim to be true is so unbelievable and so off the wall. Yes. Yeah. So I, I I mean that's another thing in the Library of Alex that there there's so much we didn't need we didn't even get into the whole flat earth thing. I mean I mean there there are so many ways uh, uh atheists misrepresent history. Yeah, I could talk about this all night really. Yeah. yeah we, well I think we basically <laughs> we basically have. So I will say uh, uh, Quill and Ink History has has an excellent channel. Please, everyone subscribe. He has an excellent, very substantive channel. And uh, uh, any last words? Uh, any last words? Good night. It's uh, two uh, two a.m. in my country, but we still managed to do this. I am so stream, sorry. So. I am so no, sorry. No, no, no. It's okay. We're all busy people. I've been dragging this guy along for for six months now, and then I had him wait till two in the morning. I, I'm I'm so sorry. I have all my you have all my apologies. Yeah, yeah. Apologies taken. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Good night. Or good afternoon, I think, for good you. Good night, good afternoon, all across the globe. Uh, uh, God bless. Thank you. Thank you.